We're doing really, really well with our microbial genetics. Um, I think we're going to finish today. Um, the topics we the topics we're working on, folks, is we're continuing our discussion of inducible operons in bacteria, E. coli, and then we'll be looking at some other bacteria. And then, folks, we're going to do a really, really quick mutations, just some highlights of mutations. And then, folks, I'm going to cut off the information for lecture exam two at the end of mutations, right? Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to excuse class. We never can do that, right? We're going to keep going. We're going to finish horizontal gene transfer, right? Um, and then if we have time, we're going to start the next unit on viruses. But, folks, I just want you to, uh, to remember that the lecture exam two information, lecture exam two is, is a week from today on Tuesday, it'll stop at mutations, okay? And any new information we start today would go on lecture exam three, all right? Okay. Okie dokie, folks. So you will recall last time we were talking about how bacteria can control transcription. We said this was control of gene expression. And we are talking about the discovery of Jacob and Minot, the French microbiologists, who discovered the LAC operon of E. coli. So folks, what, what does LAC mean? Lactose, right? And, and folks, you'll recall that an operon is a, it's a new vocabulary term. So an operon is found in bacteria, and an operon has two important DNA sequences, a promoter sequence, P is for promoter, and what binds to the promoter? RNA polymerase, right? <laughs> my my uh, black operon shish kebab of science. Okay, so you guys, so if this is RNA polymerase, bacterial RNA polymerase, remember the sigma subunit, sig sigma factor of RNA polymerase binds the promoter, right? And basically, he's going to tell RNA polymerase, start transcription here, right? Okay, so um, if RNA polymerase transcribes the three structural genes, and structural genes are genes that code information for proteins, you'll notice, you guys, that there's no transcription stop or transcription terminator sequence at the end of the LAC Z, LAC Y. It's the transcription terminator is at the end of the structural gene for LAC A. So that means that RNA polymerase is going to transcribe the lax Z, Y, and A gene into a single mRNA. What do we call mRNA that carries information for two or more um, proteins? Po polycystronic, right? I think that's one of the study guide questions, right? Okay, so we got, we got that under our belts. All right. But, but folks, remember, we were trying to think as evolutionary biologists. And as biologists, we always figure that organisms are living in environments where there isn't an overabundance of resources. So to survive, you have to be careful, right? You can't waste your energy sources. You can't waste your carbon sources, right? So you guys, remember the question we posed is, what if this was our E. coli living in an environment where there was no lactose present? Would it make survival sense to transcribe and translate the lax Z gene to make beta-galactosides if there's no lactose present? Does that make survival sense? No, it's wasteful. Would it make sense to transcribe and translate the lax Y gene for lactose transport protein if there's no lactose present? No, right? It's wasteful, yeah? So, you guys, we talked about a special DNA sequence between the promoter and the first structural gene, the LAC Y gene. What is that special DNA sequence called? We, we called it the on-off switch for transcription. The operator, right? The operator. So in E. coli, if there's no lactose present, outside of the LAC operon, there's another structural gene, the LAC I gene. What does the LAC I gene, um, which protein does the LAC I gene, LAC I gene encode? The repressor protein, right? Okay. And the, the repressor protein, you guys, it's constitutively made. That means it's constantly being made, right? Okay. So, you guys, if this is our LAC I repressor protein and there's no lactose in the environment of E. coli, how is E. coli going to shut down transcription? Where is that repressor protein going to bind? To the operator, right? Literally, you guys, it creates a physical roadblock. And you see if RNA polymerase binds the promoter, can it get past that roadblock? No, right? So transcription is turned off. Does that make sense? No lactose? 
don't want to be wasteful, right? Don't transcribe the lac offron genes if there's no lactose around. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, so in the absence of lactose, you guys, describe the lac offron. I think that's one of your study guide questions. So in the absence of lactose, describe the lac offron. It's turned off, and how is it turned off? Good. The lac I repressor is binding where? Where's the roadblock site? Operator. Awesome, you guys. So no lactose. The lac I repressor protein binds our operator, and that prevents what? Transcription. Right. Transcription. RNA polymerase can't get past. Does, does that make sense, folks? Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to talk about, well, what happens when lactose is present, right? Lactose is a wonderful energy and carbon source. Right? And folks, remember lactose is a disaccharide. It's made up of glucose covalently linked to galactose. It's a glycosidic bond. What must a bacterium or any of us do if we're going to use lactose as a source of carbon and energy? What's the first thing you have to do when you get it in, into your cell? You have to, yeah, you have to hydrolyze that glycosidic bond, right? In humans, what do we call the enzyme that hydrolyzes the glycosidic bond? Lactase, good. What's the fancy term for it, you guys, in bacteria? Beta-galactosidase, right? That's the, that's the um, protein encoded by the laxity gene. Okay, good <coughs> enough. All right. So, folks, let me, let me, pro, let me um, on our PowerPoint slides, folks, let me just, let's see here. That was slide um, six, and now we're going to go to slide seven, and this is showing the lac operon in the presence of lactose. All right? Okay. So, folks, this, this is a little bit messy, and I apologize. So um, if E. coli, if the environment changes, and suddenly the environment of E. coli, there's lots of lactose available, wonderful carbon and energy source, right? Um, so first, the lactose has to be transported into the cell. And folks, what I, I don't think I told you is there's a few lactose transport proteins um, in the cell membrane of E. coli. And the reason is, and again, I didn't go into this before, when the lac I repressor binds, it's reversible. So it's binding and releasing, binding and releasing. When there's no lactose around, we could say 99% of the time, the repressor is blocking transcription by RNA polymerase. But occasionally, right, it comes off, and occasionally RNA polymerase sneaks by to make a tiny bit of beta-galactosidase, a little tiny bit of lactose transport protein, and we're going to ignore the transacetylase gene, right? So this means that if lactose does become available, it can be transported into the cell where it will be chemically modified into allolactose, right? Okay, now what's the big deal? What's the big deal with lactose and allolactose? We're going to call those the inducers. Those are the signal molecules that are going to turn on transcription. So you guys, to turn on transcription, if the repressor is binding the operator, RNA polymerase can't get by. How would you turn on transcription? If you could come up here, what would you do to turn on transcription? Would you remove the repressor protein? Yeah, yeah perfect. We just induced the lac operon, you guys. So we need to get rid of that repressor protein so RNA polymerase can transcribe the lac operon genes. So how are we going to do that? It turns out, folks, the lac repressor protein it's what we call an allosteric protein. It has two binding sites, right? And so it has a DNA binding site where it's going to bind the operator. And in, in my thrift store toys, you guys, I couldn't find an allosteric protein. But it, it's going to have another binding site that's going to bind lactose or allolactose. You can call either one the inducer. And what happens is when, so I, I found something that looked like cheese to me to represent the lactose, allolactose. Right? You guys, this is simplified, but we're going to say when the inducer, the lactose or allolactose, binds to our, our lac repressor protein, it's going to change shape so that it can't do what? It can't bind to the operator anymore, right? That's going to remove the roadblock so that RNA polymerase can transcribe the gene, right? So the inducer is what again? Lactose slash allolactose, right? It binds to the repressor so the repressor can no longer work, meaning the lac repressor can no longer bind to the operator, right? So that's how we're going to remove the roadblock. Okay, pretty, pretty sophisticated, huh? And you guys, again, a lot of us learn kinesthetically, and even though I have these goofy thrift store toys, 
if you're a kinesthetic learner, you know, come up and play with this. I'll bring it into lab because often that's how we learn as kids by handling things, right? So if this lap operon is a difficult concept, ask for this in lab or at the end of lecture and work with it, right? And then it will make more sense. Yeah. Okay. So you guys, let's just take a look then at our PowerPoint slide. So more sophisticated, right, on the PowerPoint slide. <clears throat> so let me just quiz you guys. So this section right here, P O Z Y N A, is this the lac operon? Yes. yes. Okay. Is this lac I gene part of the lac operon? No. Good. Good job, you guys. Now remember, the lac I gene is for the lac repressor protein. It's always being transcribed and translated. So the cytoplasm is chock full of um, the, uh, lac, the lac high repressor protein. Now folks, what do you think this little green ball is? Green is for go, right? Green is for let's transcribe the lac operon. So folks, this is the inducer that's going to turn on transcription. And if it was short answer, if I ask you specifically what's the inducer in the lac operon, what are you going to tell me? Allolactose or lactose. Either one is acceptable. And here, folks, you can see our inducer is binding the lac repressor protein, which is in orange. Uh, there's a, a site to bind the inducer. The lac repressor protein changes shape. So can it, can it bind the operator now after it's changed shape? No, it can no longer bind the operator. Yeah? That gets rid of the roadblock. So who's this right here? Who's that? That's RNA polymerase, right? Now there's no more roadblocks, so RNA polymerase can transcribe the lac Z, Y, and A gene into polycystronic, messing your RNA. It is going to be translated into the three gene products, beta lactosidase, lactose transfer protein, or a lactose permease, and the transacetylase. Okay? Good job, you guys. Now, I totally understand where it's like, well, you know, that's not that exciting. You know, maybe at this point in the semester, week nine, we're all tired, right? Do we really, really care that much about the lack operon of E. coli? And I totally understand if you say, nah. Um, but folks, um, this was the first time control of gene expression was described in bacteria. And since then, people have discovered that there's important transcription control that occurs in a lot of our pathogens. So I just wanted to give you two um, applications of indu inducible operons in medical microbiology and microbes that might cause you or your family or your patients harm. So you guys, so the first one, and, and um, I, you don't have to read this paper, it's just I wanted to prove to you they've actually found this. Um, the first one I wanted to uh, mention is the concept of an, um, an antibiotic resistance, an antibiotic resistance and again this is going to be inducible so when there's a signal some kind of signal there's some kind of signal that's when transcription will be turned on and folks um, let's I'm going to totally make this up let's pretend that we've discovered an antibiotic resistance um, operon an inducible operon so you guys this is going to be our fictitious operon so P is for promoter um, O is for what? <coughs> Operator, right? And you guys, let's just make this up. Let's say we've got a beta lactamase gene. Okay, and then let's say we've got um, maybe, I'm, I'm going to make this up, a macrolide, macrolide methylase gene. We'll just keep it simple, you guys. We'll just have two. Um, uh, two genes for antibiotic resistance to two different classes of antibiotics. So the beta, beta lactamase gene, you guys, what is that going to do when it gets transcribed and translated to beta lactamase? What, what do beta lactamases do? Good. They break down, they hydrolyze beta lactams like penicillin, ampicillin, and amoxicillin. Good job, you guys. Now this one, a macrolide methylase gene, this would be a gene for an enzyme that's going to add a methyl group to macrolides, like erythromycin, um, azithromycin. And what happens when you add chemical groups to antibiotics, often they can't bind to their targets anymore, so you're in inactivating them by chemically modifying them. So you guys, we could just say, we could say how, um, let's say this is penicillin resistance, just to make it easy. 
So a penicillin resistance gene, and let's just say this is an erythromycin resistance gene. Okay, now folks, again, we're thinking as evolutionary biologists, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of resources to transcribe and translate the beta-lactamase gene and the erythromycin resistance gene. So if you're a bacterium growing in an environment where there's no antibiotics present, do you want to waste time and energy transcribing and translating these genes? No, right? That it's wasteful. So how do you think? Excuse me. How do you think? Oh, oh, no, sorry. How do you think the bacteria turn off transcription and use a lacoperon as a model? Do you think we're going to have a repressor gene over here? Does that make sense, folks? Just like we had a lac I repressor gene, we'll just call this antibiotic resistant repressor gene. And so when it, it's going to be constitutively made, constantly being transcribed and translated. And we'll just use a little cartoon, you guys, almost like our black eye repressor. So this will be our repressor. So in the absence of any antibiotics, you guys, let's pretend this is our repressor. In the absence of antibiotics, what's the repressor going to do? Where will it bind to turn off transcription? Yeah, the operator, right? So will that block, is that going to block transcription? Yeah, right? If there's no antibiotics around, don't waste resources, right? So, folks, this, this would be the question I would ask on the exam. Okay, so the repressor blocks transcription when no antibiotics present. So the question I would ask you folks then is what would be the inducer, do you think? What is going to be the signal molecule that's going to help get rid of this repressor so the bacteria, bacterium can now transcribe the antibiotic resistance genes? What do you think is the inducer? Yeah, and you, you could just say in general, guys, an antibiotic is going to be the inducer, right? So the inducer, what would you answer, you guys? An antibiotic, right? And, and you would be, I think you would be spot on to say like either say penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, or erythromycin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get that detail. We, we just want to recognize you guys to turn on transcription of the <laughs> antibiotic resistance genes. The inducer, it makes sense. The inducer it will be an antibiotic, right? You guys sound right with that? So folks, what, what the antibiotic inducer, how will it turn on transcription? What is the inducer going to do? Find the repressor, get it to change shape, so it's going to do what? Fall off. Good. Excellent. You guys nailed it. Okay, so we'll just, the cartooning, my cartooning isn't very good. The inducer of the antibiotic, so it's going to bind. The antibiotic's going to bind to what, you guys? Binds to repressor. What happens to the repressor? Changes shape. We'll put rep. Change, changes shape. So what's the consequence of the repressor changing shape? Falls off where? There you go. Okay, Re repressor changes shape. Um, the repressor, we could say no longer, no longer can find what? The operator. The operator. Awesome, you guys. And what's the consequence if the repressor falls off? Yeah, exactly. Result, transcription by which enzyme? Good, good, excellent. You guys nailed it. Excellent. So again, folks, even though maybe um, understanding the lac operon isn't that, oh, maybe it just doesn't, it maybe doesn't strike you as being, oh, who cares, right? But, but bacteria use this strategy to control um, transcription of their antibiotic resistance genes. And that makes them more fit for their environment, right? They're not being wasteful. Good. And, and again, folks, this I just wanted you to see that I'm not totally making this up. This was just a paper where they were talking about inducible clindamycin resistance. And, and it, this does create a problem, you guys, if you're working in a lab and you're trying to do antibiotic sensitivity testing, which we're going to do in a few weeks. Um, this can get tricky, right? And we won't even worry about that. Maybe, maybe in lab we'll, we'll come back and talk about why would inducible antibiotic resistance be um, 
hard maybe to detect in a microbiology lab, but we'll use that. We'll leave that for lab, rather. And folks, this is another one. This is really pretty complicated. But again, I wanted you to see how when um, bacteria evolve these strategies that increase their survival, then we start seeing the strategy repeated over and over and over again. So this last one, you guys, which is on inducible operons, this is a bonus. This would be a bonus on exam two. So again, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just don't even worry about it. And the, um, the example we're going to use here, folks, is a specific bacterial pathogen called Carinibacterium diphtheria. And so this, the bacterium, you guys, it's Carinibacterium. Sorry, yes, C O R Y N E B A C T E R I U M, Carini bacterium diphtheria. I always forget all the H's in here. Diphtheria. Okay, oops, and there's an E on the end. Okay, there. All right, so you guys, let me first show you what, what disease Carini. Carini bacterium diphtheria causes. Any guesses, you guys, which disease do you think Carini bacterium diphtheria causes? Diphtheria, yeah. And you guys, this can be a really devastating childhood disease. So what happens is um, if we're exposed, the bacteria, they colonize the mucous membranes in the back of our throat. They don't invade our bloodstream, but... What they do is once they invade us, they start making a powerful um, protein toxin called an, um, an exotoxin. We'll be talking about this in medical micro. So exotoxins are protein toxins. And the specific exotoxin you guys is called, as you might guess, diphtheria toxin. And what diphtheria toxin does, it inhibits ADS ribosomes. Why do we care about ADS ribosomes? Yeah, those are the ribosomes we use, right? We're eukaryotes, we have ADS ribosomes. And by inhibiting ADS ribosome function, this can cause host cell death. And I'll put a host in here, you guys, human cell death, okay? All right, so it's fascinating. The crinibacterium diphtheria don't start making toxin until they're inside us. Because it does make sense, doesn't it, you guys? If they're out in the environment, they're not living in um, a human, would it make survival sense for them to be making diphtheria toxin when there's no human cell to destroy, right? So it's fascinating. They don't make toxin until they colonize us. And, and we'll, we'll talk about how they induce that toxin gene. But the damage, folks, is... Um, we get a really strong inflammatory response, and we get like fibrin deposited, and what results, this is called a pseudomembrane, a false membrane, right, from all this inflammatory exudate fibrin. And it can get so bad, you guys, can you imagine it might actually block um, airflow? Yeah. And my thought was, if I looked in the throat of my kid and I saw that there, I'm like, I'm going to go in there and rip it out, right? And that's horrible because it caused massive hemorrhage. The bacteria are still there pumping out their toxin, right? So it's going to quickly reform. And who knows, you know, are you going to control the hemorrhage going on, right? And, it, and is it, that's not bad enough, folks. Even though the bacteria don't invade our bloodstream, do you think that bacteria toxin is absorbed by the bloodstream? Yeah, and it spreads throughout the body. And a big target where it can cause a lot of damage is the heart. So even though the bacteria are in, in your throat, can you have heart damage from it? Yeah, <clears throat> big time, big time. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and, and, and furthermore, you guys, with the um, the toxin, it can cause for this. You know, this is pretty pretty dramatic. But this is an ulcer caused by the toxin, right? So this can be really nasty stuff. Now, for us kind of on the nerdy side, let's back up you guys. So we, we want to understand how is it that crinibacteria diphtheria turns on toxin production when it gets into us. And this is really fascinating, you guys. And again, this is bonus. So if, it's, if, it, if you find it not fascinating, it's okay. <clears throat> so what happens is the diphtheria, 
coxin G is part of an inducible alkaline. And this is a little, this is really interesting, you guys. So what happens is um, in the presence of iron, a repressor protein binds the toxin operator or the toxin operator. The toxin operon operator. So if, if the microbe is living in an environment where there's lots of free iron available, right, that's usually signaled you're not living in a human, and, and I'll tell you why, right? So if the bacterium has lots and lots of iron available, it, it, it's, it's tricky, you guys, what happens, the iron binds to the repressor, and that makes the repressor active. It can then bind to the operator and block transcription, right? But when crinobacterium diphtheria invades us, we have evolved mechanisms to keep iron away from invading pathogens. Many invading pathogens require our iron, for example, to make cytochromes, right? If they have electron transport chains, they need iron to make cytochromes for the electron <coughs> transport chain. So through natural selection, humans have evolved ways to bind up our free iron so it's not available to invading pathogens, right? So you guys, what if you were crying bacterium diphtheria and you're going from the environment, lots of iron available, and now you've colonized the throat of a human, what would be an environmental signal that you're inside a human? Low, low iron, right? Okay. So in humans, um, iron is not available to most microbes. So for example, we have iron binding proteins that bind our iron so won't, the microbes can't use it. So in humans, iron is not available to most microbes. So we would call it a low, a low free iron environment. So what happens is when crinobacterium diphtheria invades us, now there's not enough iron available to bind to the repressor right, to get it to change shape so it can bind to the operator. So in the low environment, uh, the low iron environment of humans, the repressor falls off the operator, and what happens? The toxin gene is transcribed, right? And I know you guys, that's just like, it's, that's like kind of mental gymnastics. But how, sh how could I ask this is a bonus question on the lecture exam. So you guys, um, is the diphtheria toxin gene inducible? Yes, it can be turned on, right? What is the signal that will induce diphtheria toxin gene transcription? What's the signal? Low iron, Low iron right? Low free iron, right? That tells a microbe that you're now in a human, right? And to get iron, what are you going to need to do? Destroy some of the human cells. That's the job, right, of the diphtheria toxin, to get the cells to release iron. Okay, that's really convoluted, you guys, and I'm and I do apologize. But again, to me, it's like we, we give you kind of these, maybe it sounds like ivory tower models, but then we want to see, wow, the pathogens are using these strategies, right, to increase their survival and their, their success in the environment. On a practical level, you guys, can we prevent diphtheria? Yeah, we can, right? So you guys have probably heard of... Um, the DTAP vaccine, right? What does the D stand for? Diphtheria, yeah. We can prevent our kids from de developing diphtheria. The D is for diphtheria. What's the T for? Tetanus, so-called lock jaw, right? And the AP, you guys, the A means acellular pertussis. Pertussis, another name is what? Whooping cough, right? So you guys, when we, when we come, after viruses and prions, we're going to do medical micro. We'll come back and talk about the toxins, and we'll talk about the vaccines in more detail. But the important thing is, you guys, we can vaccinate our kids, vaccinate ourselves to prevent diphtheria, right? And, and, and we'll also talk about if maybe there's a child that hasn't been vaccinated and they develop diphtheria, we can actually harvest antibodies from somebody who has been vaccinated and give it to the child to help protect the child from the 
um, effects of the toxin. So again, this is going to be med microimmunology later on. Okay? All right. Oh, and just, you guys, so the, just the, the toxin damages the epithelium, so that could lead to the ulcers, <coughs> damage to the heart, kidneys, and even nerve tissue, right? Okay, so do you, I mean, and you, you guys, I have to be careful because I'm a huge advocate of vaccination, and I know some people aren't, but boy, man, if you can do anything to protect your children from some of these um, diseases, I, I really want to promote that. Okay, all right. So you guys, um, this says you're going to do a homework sheet, but instead I think what we're going to do is just hit some highlights of mutations. The so-called homework sheet, let me see if I've got mine here. Okay, so you guys, if we take a look at the microbial genetics part two study guide, right, that we passed out last, last week, right? Okay, so we've gone through um, the first page on control of gene expression. The second page, you guys, again, it's control of gene expression, the LAC operon. The third page is um, the antibiotic resistance operon and the bonus on diphtheria toxin, right? And folks, then it says on page three, mutations, homework questions. Well, we're just going to do, do them really briefly, go through them really briefly. And I did try, you guys, on your study guide to provide answers to the questions there, right? Um, and it's at the end of mutations, folks, and mutation goes from page three over to midway of page four. At the end, at the end there, that would be the end for lecture exam two information. Okay? All right. So let's just do mutations, you guys, kind of briefly. Yeah. Did you pass this out last time? I think I passed this out last time. Is that right, you guys? Did I pass it out last time? Let me see what I got here for you. We'll, we'll be answering most of the mutations questions here. Okay. So you, you, you need some? Okay. Yeah. I did. How about we do that after okay. lecture? Yeah, okay. That's fine. Okay, all right, folks. So this will this will go pretty quickly. And again, it's it's at the end of mutations. That will be the end of the information for lecture exam two. But we're still going to keep going, you guys. back and forth between the PowerPoint slides, folks, and our, um, our study guide here. So you guys, what are mutations? First answer if we're talking about cells. What are mutations in cells? Good. Changes in the DNA sequence. Why, why would changes in the DNA sequence be significant? Why are they important? What does the DNA sequence determine? The amino acid sequence, right, of the proteins, right? So if we change the DNA sequence, what might we do to the so-called mutant protein? Change the amino acid sequence of the protein, right? Could that possibly make the mutant protein fold differently? Mm-hmm. Could we, if it folded differently, might it lose function? Yeah, that could be. But you guys, if it folds differently, might it acquire a new function? Yeah, and that's something we often forget, right? You guys, so... Um, Mutations um, contribute to the diversity, the genetic diversity of populations of organisms, and that's required for natural selection to work, and that's required for biological evolution to work, right? So mutations aren't always bad. We sometimes think they're always bad. Okay, 
So you guys, what would be the spontaneous mutation rate in cells? So mutations mean, like, let's think of, of the mutations, you guys, as mistakes that DNA polymerase makes. So does DNA polymerase proofread or edit? It does, right? And after proofreading or editing, what is its mistake rate? Approximately, ballpark. Yeah, yeah, one wrong nucleotide in every 10 to the 9th. Some books say 10 to the 11th nucleotides, right? So remember, a wrong nucleotide, you guys, is a mutation, right, when we're dealing with genetic information. Good job, you guys. So let's see here. What, um, and so we're going to call that um, mistake rate of DNA polymerase after proofreading the spontaneous mutation rate, right? Every time your chromosomes are copied, there's some mistakes made. So that's always a background mutation rate. Good. Um, you guys, what, how, hmm, blah, blah, blah. Um, in viruses, what is the genetic information of viruses? Y yeah, DNA or RNA. So you guys, what would be your guess of the spontaneous mutation rate of DNA viruses? Low, Low right? And why? Yeah, so if you're a DNA virus, which enzyme will you use to copy your viral DNA? DNA polymerases. And do DNA polymerases proofread? Yes, they do. Good. So we would expect the DNA viruses should have a relatively low mutation rate. But the big one is, you guys, what about RNA viruses? What, what is the genetic information of RNA viruses? RNA. RNA. So which enzymes are going to make RNA for the RNA viruses? RNA. RNA polymerases. Do RNA polymerases proofread? No. Nope, they don't. So you guys, what would be the spontaneous mutation rate in RNA viruses? Yeah, one wrong nucleotide, one mutation every 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 5th nucleotide. That's a really high mutation rate, right? And it's because RNA polymerases don't proofread, okay? So that's, that's just really big information there, you guys, the spontaneous mutation rate. Good. And when we come back and talk about RNA viruses, again, we'll see the consequences of that really high mutation rate. Good job, you guys. All right. So let's just take a look here at the study guide. Okay, so we're asking about spontaneous mutation rates. Okay, okay, and then folks, um, on, on your study guide, number four, it says, what are mutagens? So mutagens are substances or physical factors that increase mutation rates above that background spontaneous mutation rate, right? And we'll, um, Right, we're just going to leave it at that, okay, for mutagens. We're going to talk about a specific uh, mutagenic factor, UV radiation, here in just a bit. So, folks, now we're down on number five. We want to describe different types of mutations, right? So, uh, a, point, a point mutation, you guys, or base substitution, is when you have a change, let's say, let's say, okay, let's say types of mutations, and we'll introduce some vocabulary. So the so-called normal DNA sequence is, we'll call it the wild type. The wild type or, or normal DNA sequence. Okay. And folks, we'll just zero in, let's say, just on um, three nucleotides, three bases. And again, folks, just random. I'll just say GAC. Let's say in the wild type normal DNA, we should have GAC. And let's say in the process of replication, right, there's a mutation so that instead of GAC, we're going to end up with GGC, right? So that would be our point mutation, a single nucleotide, a single base change, right? So you guys, we want to ask ourselves, well, so what? What's, what's the consequence? Well, sometimes a point mutation will be what's called a silent mutation. And a silent mutation is when the, the single change, um, the single nucleotide or base change, when that DNA sequence is transcribed and translated, it doesn't change the amino acid sequence. And the reason is, do you guys remember when we were talking about the genetic code and we said the genetic code was degenerate, right? Degenerate meaning that more than one mRNA codon would be translated into an amino acid, yeah? So, and we said it was protection against mutations, right? So it's possible, you guys, without my genetic code table, I can't tell you, but it's possible, we'll, we'll just pretend, you guys, let's say 
this DNA, when it was transcribed into the mRNA, would be translated, I'm going to make this up, into leucine. And let's say in this mutant DNA, when this DNA was transcribed into mRNA, this mRNA um, codon was translated, it also ended up being leucine, right? That's a silent mutation. We wouldn't even know it in the amino acid sequence of the protein, right? Okay. But, folks, in, um, in contrast to our silent mutations, we can have missense mutations. And in a missense mutation, right, when the mutated DNA is transcribed and then the mRNA is translated, you, you get a change in the amino acid, right? So again, you guys, let's say in the wild type, if the DNA was translated, the mRNA codon would be translated into leucine, right? But in the mutated DNA, when it was transcribed and the mRNA was um, translated, let's say the new codon would be translated to alanine. Do we get a change in the amino acid? Yeah, so that's called missense, when you change from one amino acid to another. Now again, folks, um, do you think that could impact, if we change the amino acid sequence, could that impact how the mutant protein folds? It could, right? What could be the consequences? Could we lose function? Yeah. Could we get new function? Yeah. And, and it's possible, you guys, that that maybe if it's like minimal misfolding, it might be that it still functions just fine, right? So it's like we always have to, you know, we have to ask more questions to find out what the consequences would be. Good. And then, folks, finally, the last mutation is called a nonsense mutation. And in nonsense mutations, what happens, your, your normal sense codon in your RNA when it gets mutated, it's changed. Okay, the mutation results in a uh, nonsense codon. And what do nonsense codons encode, you guys? Stop, right? This is a stop translation, right? So a sense codon, you're going to have some kind of amino acid. Following the mutation, right, the change, that, that mRNA is then read as a stop codon. It's going to stop translation. So if that happens early in the mRNA, your protein is going to be worthless, right? Maybe if it happens almost at the very end, the tail end of the mRNA, you know, maybe, maybe your protein will just be a little bit short, right? And it won't be that bad. So again, we have to ask ourselves, well, where, where is this occurring? What kind of impact does it have on the proteins? Okay. So you guys, let me see here. Um, If in a point mutation there's no change in the amino acid sequence of the resulting protein, what, what kind of mutation do we call, call that? Silent, good. Um, if in a point mutation um, we get a change of one amino acid to a different amino acid, what do we call that? Missense, good. Um, in a point mutation, if we have a sense codon gets changed into a stop codon, what's that called? Nonsense, right? So we, we stop translation early. Good. I mean, you guys, that's how superficial it's going to be on the lecture exam. Okay, it's not going to be in great depth. Okay. Okay. What's the frame shift? Yeah, so that's what we're going we're gonna to nail right now, you guys. So if I ask you on the exam, what are the most devastating types of mutations, you're going to tell me frame shift mutations. Right? So point mutations, you guys, pretty simple, right? Most devastating is what are called frame shift mutations. And this is this is a little bit messy to explain. All right. So most devastating, most harmful, most devastating or harmful are frame shift mutations. Okay, so let me see you guys if I can maybe give a little bit better example than I did yesterday in the Monday lecture. Okay, because I didn't really explain what we mean by reading frame. Okay, so you guys, if we have mRNA here, and um, again, I'm just going to put a random sequence here. So let's say G A C C um, U. U, A, C, G, U. Okay. 
So, so folks, um, ribosomes, how do they read mRNA? They read them in triplets, right, in codons, right? Okay. So could, could one reading frame, you guys, be this would be codon 1, this is codon 2, and this is codon 3, for example, right? And so codon 1 is translated to amino acid, codon 2 into amino acid, codon 3 into amino acid, okay? But you guys, what happens if, and I'll do, the, I'll do the same example that they have on this slide, what happens if I expose myself maybe to some chemical that causes a deletion, right? We're going to get rid of a nucleotide. So you guys, I'm going to cross this one out. Let's say this is a deletion, Okay. Or, sorry, you guys, that, it would have been actually in the DNA. It would have been the DNA that would have encoded the mRNA, but we're just going to cross that guy out right now, okay? So, you guys, would that change how the ribosome reads the mRNA? So, let, let's do it. Let's, this is our, our um, mutant mRNA, right? So, we're going to have GCCUUACG. Okay, so in the mutant RNA, you guys, because we've got a, a deletion, how will the ribosome read the mutant mRNA? G, C, C. Yeah, so this is codon 1, codon 2, codon 3. Okay, so it changes how the ribosome reads the mRNA. If we have a deletion or an addition of nucleotides that aren't multiples of 3, right? So the consequence, you guys, if we had the genetic code table here, we would see the, um, the amino acid sequence is going to be totally different following where that deletion or an insertion occurs. So it totally messes up the amino acid sequence. There's no way that that mutant protein is going to fold into any kind of functional shape, right? So that's why, folks, just remember for our lecture exam, the most devastating, the most harmful types of mutations are what? Frame shift. And by frame shift, you guys were talking about how the ribosomes are reading. The reading frame of the ribosome gets changed, right? Disaster. Disastrous. Okay. And this was just a, a, a short little example, you guys. This is our wild type DNA, mRNA. This is the wild type amino acid sequence. Here's, this is what would have happened, you guys. So this is the DNA. We have a deletion, right? We're getting rid of one of those um, adenines. And so here's the mutant mRNA, and you can see that following the deletion, that the amino acid sequence totally changes. We're going from phenylalanine glycine to leucine alanine, and all the additional amino acids will be totally different, really devastating. And you might say, well, how does this happen? And this, this, is, this is really tough, you guys. So um, there are toxins in cigarette smoke. Cigarette, cigarette smoke. Okay, cigarette smoke, and also folks, um, folks that that like fire, uh, folks that firefighters, firefight. Can you imagine in those horrible fires all the really yucky, toxic stuff that was burning, and the firefighters were breathing that, you know, day in and day out. So smoke can contain substances, carcinogens, carcin, mutagens. And sometimes mutagens, you guys, can cause what? Yeah, cancer, so carcinogens, right? So cigarette smoke, smoke has um, mutagens that can cause enough damage in our cells to cause what? Can cancer, right? And that's why folks that are long-term uh, cigarette smokers, um, cigar smokers, are at higher risk for lung cancer, right? And again, folks in these really hazardous occupations, like firefighters, right? They could be at higher risk for, um, for lung cancer. And um, an, another, another, um, another toxin, you guys, that's this microbial related is um, aflatoxin. Aflatoxin. This is not going to be on the exam, you guys, at all. But I just wanted to, to share with you aflatoxin. This is a fungal toxin. It was associated with eating um, moldy peanuts, moldy peanuts, and aflatoxin can cause frame shift mutations that increase the risk for liver cancer. So we can see uh, just these two examples, you guys, 
is that when we're exposed to, for example, chemicals, it can cause frame shift mutations. It can increase our risk for certain types of cancers. Yeah, okay, nasty, nasty stuff. And then, folks, this is another, um, again, trying to find a more, you know, kind of practical application related to microbiology. This would be a bonus question, folks. So this is a bonus. And again, trying to introduce you to some of these um, microbial pathogens. So there's a really important pathogen called Clostridium difficile. What's the nickname, you guys, of Clostridium difficile? C. diff, exactly. So those of you working in medical facilities, nursing home, you're, you know, probably know, unfortunately, a lot about C. diff. Right? And it's bad news, you guys, it makes endospores. And these endospores are resistant to antibiotics, um, they're resistant to like they're resistant to alcohol hand sanitizers. They survive in a patient's room for you know weeks and weeks and weeks in the dust, right? Um, and the problem is is that C diff it 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 makes a toxin, and the toxin oh, excuse me I should I should do this in order here, you guys. Okay, so we get colonized in the intestine. where the bacteria, they make a toxin, and the toxin triggers inflammation and diarrhea. And because of the inflammation, you guys, it, this, it's so weird. It's kind of like diphtheria, but instead of it being in the throat, where is it? It's in your intestine. So this inflammation causes pseudo, a pseudomembrane, one of those false membranes, again, to form. So this is often referred to as pseudomembranous colitis because it's occurring in the colon. Pseudomembranous colitis. And you know, a big concern is in your high-risk patients, and often this happens in nursing homes or um, when people have been put on broad-spectrum antibiotics. If you have an elderly patient, they're a high-risk um, population, right? And they can rapidly dehydrate. And furthermore, you guys, what's in the diarrhea? Endospores, right? So this is a huge, huge issue because endospores are resistant to so many things. Um, now, why am I bringing this up? Because um, for many, many years, we always thought if you were going to get infected, yeah. Oh, do you know about um, endospores? That I don't know. Is that something? It's like a, it's like they use to disinfect things. It's like all the Can you sh can you shoot me the spelling of it? I'd love to look it up because this is really good for us to know. If it that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> frame shift mutations. Okay, so you guys, so um, for many years it was thought that C. diff infections, you acquired them in medical facilities. They were hospital acquired, nursing home acquired, right? Infections. But a few years ago, there a horrible discovery was made in that. Young, healthy people that hadn't been in the hospital were, were coming down with a hypervirulent. Virulence, you guys, is the amount of damage done. So hypervirulence, these are strains that cause immense amounts of damage. So hy hypervirulent, hypervirulent, community acquired, not acquired at the hospital. You know, you're just living your life. You're acquiring them in your community. C. diff. And they couldn't figure out why they caused so much damage. And, and again, you guys, it's related to frame shift. So, so normally, Clostridium difficile, the, their toxin is on an inducible gene, right? And usually they have transcription turned off until they get like to late log, stationary phase of growth, and then they turn on um, the induction of this gene. But what happens in this hypervirulent strain there was a frame shift mutation in the gene for the repressor protein. So there's a frame shift mutation in gene for the um, toxin repressor protein. So what this meant was that now instead of the C diff only turning on toxin production in late log stationary, it's constantly making it, right? And that's, that's what was making them so virulent, is they were just making huge amounts of toxin. 
And, and the big concern, you guys, with this is when they get really hypervirulent like that, you can have perforation of the intestine. What does that mean? Punch a hole, yeah. Right, so much toxin that you actually get a perforated intestine, and that can lead to a peritonitis, right? And that can kill you rapidly. So again, you guys, just kind of trying to find some microbial applications of some of these terms. That would be, again, you guys, just a bonus question. But I think it is really important for us to know that you can acquire these really serious C. diff infections now just being in your community. Yeah, so watch out for that. Okay. Okay, you guys, so we're going to move on to, um, this is going to be a lab experiment we do, you guys. We're going to use um, UV irradiation to cause mutation in our bacteria to kill them, right, to kill them. So we want to understand how is it that UV causes mutations, how is it that it kills the cells, and then we want to ask about what's, what's the impact on humans, um, and can we use UV radiation to, and you guys probably know this already, destroy endospores in our patients' rooms, right? So it kind of it comes together here. So folks, we're going to, again, we're going to run this experiment in a couple of weeks in lab, so this is a new type of DNA damage we're going to do. So we'll, we'll work this up on the board. So what does UV stand for, folks? Ultraviolet. ultraviolet. Yeah. The electromagnetic spectrum ultraviolet radiation. And um, we talk about wavelengths, folks. In general, the shorter the wavelength, the more damage it causes. So wavelength is a wavelength. So the wavelength that we're going to um, use is the wavelength that causes maximal DNA damage. It's going to be around 260 nanometers. I think officially it's supposed to be like 254 nanometers, but we'll use 260 nanometers here. Okay. Um, so what happens, folks, the mechanism here is I'll use, I'll use our PowerPoint slide. So when we shine our UV lights onto our poor little bacteria, we're going we're gonna to swab them on the surface of an auger plate. We have to take the lid off the plate because UV doesn't penetrate, right? So we're going to zap our poor little bacteria. What happens, the energy from the UV radiation is absorbed by DNA, and it triggers electron rearrangements. And one of the abnormal results, you guys, is if we have two thymines side by side on a DNA strand, they will break the hydrogen bonds with the opposite strand, with the adenines on the complementary strand, and through electron rearrangement, they're going to form this abnormal covalent bond between the two thymines. And this um, abnormality, you guys, is called a thymine dimer, like two parts. Now, is that normal? No, that's abnormal, right? Okay, and you can see it causes a little buckle here in the DNA. That buckle can cause DNA polymerase to stall. It can cause RNA polymerase to stall, right? So that could be deadly. Now, we want to remember, you guys, that cellular organisms have been evolving on the surface of Earth for you know, thousands and thousands of years. And you guys, it's UV in sunlight, right? Right? UV, UV is in sunlight. So you know there's been natural selection for repair mechanisms. So we're going to discuss two repair mechanisms. The first one, you guys, is called light repair because it requires visible light to activate an enzyme called photolyase. And photolyase, you guys, this is so awesome. Photolyase can recognize the thymine dimers and just cut, hydrolyze that covalent bond between the two thymines. And voila, now you're back to normal DNA structure, right? But a backup system has evolved called dark repair because it doesn't require visible light or excision repair. What does excision mean? To, to cut out, right? So this is a more complicated system of proteins and enzymes that can recognize that abnormal uh, stretch of DNA. The proteins and enzymes bind, and then we have enzymes that will cut out that abnormal um, thymine dimer. With, with probably some neighboring nucleotides on either side. So that's the excision, right? And then DNA polymerase 1 will come along and replace the damaged DNA with normal DNA using the opposite strand as a template. And then you guys, which enzyme is going to covalently link the end of the new DNA with the old strand up here? Ligase, right? Yeah, okay. 
Now you might say, well, what's the problem? You know, what's, what's, that sounds perfectly fine. But folks, does DNA polymerase one make mistakes? Like in our, in our E. coli? Yeah, it does, right? So you guys, if we have lots and lots and lots of thymine dimers, are we having lots of repairs? And is that gonna increase mutation rate? Yes, it is, yeah? And so there comes a point, you guys, where the bacteria, they can no longer uh, maybe make the repairs, or if they're making the repairs, there are so many mistakes made that the bacteria are going to die, right? And you're gonna be amazed, you guys, in lab, um, you're gonna irradiate your bacteria for four minutes, and you're gonna wipe out almost all of them in four minutes. It's just amazing, yeah. So one thing we want to remember, you guys, is when we have our UV lights in lab, are you going to use them as lightsabers? No, right? Because is that same thing happening to us? Yes, it is, right, you guys? So the UV and sunlight is really damaging, right? It can contribute to aging. And fortunately, it can contribute to cancer. So squamous cell, basal cell, melanoma. Like a big piece of my lip they had to cut out a couple of years ago because I had basal cell carcinoma. It was because when we were kids, how do you welcome summer? You go out and get a, a third degree sunburn, right? Every summer, that's how we welcome summer, right? So that excess of sunlight when we're young, that can really increase our risk for, for cancers later in life. So that's why we try to be a little bit more protective with our kids. You guys, can UV radiation damage your eyes? Yeah, so you guys, in lab, when we're trying to figure out if our UV lights are on, like I'll pretend this is my UV light, do we wanna go, is it on? No. Right, so we'll, we'll show you a safer way to do it. But again, folks, just make sure that you're not shining it on your skin, your eyes, nor on, on your colleagues, yeah. And furthermore, folks, um, they are using UV lights. Um, they, they're making these cool little robots um, that will go into a patient's room when they're gone. Let's say they've had C. diff, right? What's, what's a big concern of, in the patient's room? The endospores, right? So they'll send in these UV robots that are gonna irradiate the whole room, right? And, and your colleagues that have worked in hospitals where these are used, they say you open up all the drawers, right? You're trying to get as much surface area where the endospores might be resting, trying to get them exposed. So these UV robots, you guys, they're really helpful in decontaminating like patients' rooms or um, maybe surgical sites. surgical, um, operating rooms. But again, really, really helpful trying to get rid of the endospores that, um, that can contaminate a patient's room if they've had C. diff diarrhea, right? Um, um, if you're working in a microbiology lab, folks often, if they have a safety hood, they'll have a bank of regular visible lights and a bank of UV lights. You turn on the UV lights when you finish working to decontaminate any pathogens there. But folks, um, previous students have said that they've been in work situations where like maybe the UV lights have been on in a, in a hood or maybe UV lights are on, say, maybe in a operating room and they've seen their, um, their colleagues walk in. And it's like, you know, this is something to spread the word, you guys, let people know, don't expose yourself to that UV light, right? Because it's gonna cause damage to eyes and skin Right, so not all people are aware of that, and it's something you need to kind of, you need to watch each other, make sure everybody stays safe in, in those working situations. Okay, so again, you guys, we're going to do this um, experiment in lab, and it's pretty amazing, I can tell you that. Okay, all right, folks. All right, so this is, this is just the text, folks, for what we just said orally, all right? So you guys, what's light repair? We'll, we'll quiz you. Photolyase, and how does photolyase deal with thymine dimers? Cuts, cuts the covalent bond, good. What is dark repair? What's another name for dark repair? Excision, Excision repair, good. Okay, so we're gonna cut out the damaged piece of DNA. How is that damaged piece of DNA replaced? DNA polymerase one. So there's another job for DNA polymerase one. It's involved in excision repair. How are we gonna link the end of the new DNA with the old DNA? That's like these. Good, good job, you guys. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. And you guys, okay, so that is the end of lecture exam two information. So let me ask you this, folks. Um, do you want me to start on lecture exam three information or do you want me to quiz you a little bit? Quit, yeah, okay. I, and, and you guys, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to metabolism. 
because that was a huge unit. And it was, doesn't it seem like it was last year that we did metabolism? Oh my God, yeah, I know. And, and the challenge is, everybody, are you guys a little bit tired right now? <laughs> yeah, everybody's a little bit tired right now. And we've got this big, big lecture exam too, and it deals with two really big units, metabolism and microbial genetics, okay? So you guys, let me, this is not to stress you out, but it's just to kind of get the memory cells activated, okay? Um, And, and again, folks, this is nothing I've organized. This is just going to be totally off the top of my head, okay? So, but let's just start thinking about metabolism again. Okay, so metabolism, all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. What are two, um, two basic types of metabolic reactions, you guys? Good, anabolism and catabolism, okay. Which process usually releases energy. Catabolism, good. And that energy can be used to drive synthesis of what? ATP. ATP. Awesome, you guys. Does anabolism need an input of energy? Right, yeah. So the, um, the energy released from catabolism can help drive ATP synthesis, and then ATP synthesis can help drive an anabolism. Good, right? So you guys, if I ask you, which molecule links energy releasing catabolic reactions with energy requiring anabolic reactions in the cell? What would be a good answer? ATP. Good, good, good job, you guys. All right. All right. Um, so, in cells, most metabolic reactions are catalyzed by what? What are, what are the organic catalysts most commonly? Organic catalysts, catalyst speed of chemical reactions, made of proteins. Good, excellent, you guys. Enzymes, awesome. How do enzymes speed up chemical reactions? They lower the activation energy. Yes, good job, you guys. Um, enzymes have an active site. What's the active site? What's the active site? What is the active site? It's a fancy name for substrate binding site. Awesome, you guys. That's that's excellent. Okay, can enzymes be denatured? Yes. How? Good. It, yeah. So, it, especially high temperatures, you guys. So high temperatures, right? What else? Good. Extremes of pH, right? Physical abuse, heavy metals. Right. Remember, in the old days, they would use heavy metals for um, as antimicrobials. Good job, you guys. All right. Um, okay. What about enzyme inhibitors? This was kind of a big topic, wasn't it? So, are there two types of enzyme inhibitors, folks? Actually, there's a whole bunch of types. So, oh well, wait, I should do this. Sugar. Okay. Um, yeah, because there's, there's many different ways we could concept this. So you guys, are enzyme inhibitors, are there reversible enzyme inhibitors? And are there irreversible? Yes, okay. Now, in cells, if cells are using, or if cells are making reversible, excuse me, if um, cells are making enzyme inhibitors, they're always going to be reversible. A cell never wants to permanently turn off an enzyme, right? That would be wasteful. So you guys, when we're talking about irreversible enzyme inhibitors, are we talking about substances that are usually harmful for the cell? Yes, good. Good, 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 you guys. Okay. And then, um, how should I, how should I... I haven't thought this out, you guys, and I apologize. So um, in enzyme, let's do it again. I'm so sorry. I just didn't think this out ahead of time. So enzyme inhibitors, you guys, um, is there another way to classify inhibitors based on where they bind the enzyme? Is Okay, yeah, there is. So you guys, what is a competitive inhibitor?
Good, good, good. So you guys, can we pretend this, well, this isn't, this is an enzyme. Anyway, okay. So you guys, let's pretend this is our enzyme. This is the active site. What is that? The subject binding site, right? So you guys are um, competitive inhibitors, red for inhibit to stop. Do they compete with a substrate for the active site, right? So they're competing with a substrate. If the competitive inhibitor enters the active site, can the substrate enter? No. Okay, good. So competitive inhibitors. Good. And then what's the other type, you guys? If we have an allosteric enzyme, what's an allosteric enzyme? So let me put this here. So this isn't the inhibitor, you guys. I'm putting allosteric enzyme because this, this other type of inhibition, it requires allosteric enzymes. Okay, and let me, just, let me just make an allosteric enzyme. Allosteric enzymes have two binding sites, you guys. And what are the binding sites? Good. Active site for substrate. And what else? Awesome. Awesome. Active site binds substrate. And this other site, you guys, is called what? Yeah, for us, and I know it's I know you guys in AMP we probably went into a lot more detail. We're keeping it really simple. We're calling this the allosteric site. And what does it bind? It binds the non-competitive inhibitor, right? Binds the NCI, the non-competitive inhibitor, or the allosteric inhibitor. Allosteric inhibitor. <coughs> so guys, with um, non-competitive inhibition, so that's what we're talking about here, non-competitive inhibition, how does the NCI, the non-competitive inhibitor, or the allosteric inhibitor, how does it turn off? How does it turn off the enzyme? So the enzyme can't function. Good. So you guys, if this is our NCI, our allosteric inhibitor, where is it going to bind? The allosteric site, and what happens when it binds? Good. It changes the shape. And and how does that turn off the enzyme? Yeah, right? The, we have a change in the active site, so substrate can't bind. Good job, you guys. Excellent. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, are non-competitive inhibitors often used by cells in feedback or end product inhibition? Yeah, they are. Good. Okay. So we just want to remember feedback, feedback or end product inhibition. It's non-NCIs are often used. Good, you guys. Excellent. Okay. Oh, sugar. Okay. Um, so, you guys, can you name an irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial transpeptidase? Okay, start, start historically, you guys. Name the first irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial transpeptidase discovered by Alexander Fleming. Penicillin, right? And penicillin, you guys, belongs to which family of antibiotics? Beta-lactams, good. Is penicillin narrow spectrum or broad spectrum? Narrow, primarily for what? Gram positives. Mostly, or not always, but mostly, you guys, mostly gram positives. Good. And, and you guys, um, what did they make historically that had broader spectrum that could pass through the outer membrane pores of gram negatives? Yeah, yeah, so extended, extended or broad spectrum. Meaning active against both gram positives and gram negatives. So the, the ones we used, you guys, were ampicillin and amoxicillin. <coughs> okay. Can you name, and we'll stop with this one, you guys. Can you name a bacterial enzyme which destroys penicillin amp and amoxicillin? A bacterial enzyme that destroys, hydrolyzes penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin? 
beta lactamines. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. And should we stop there? Okay. So, you guys, I think what we'll do then is Thursday, we will try to finish um, the microbial genetics, the horizontal gene transfer. That'll be the start of lecture exam three. And maybe again, maybe like the half, last half hour, we, we can do a little bit more review and recognize you guys, it can't be exhaustive, but at least maybe the metabolism things, right? I could just kind of, um, we could try to trigger our memory of what we did in metabolism. And then, folks, also I forgot to tell you that this Friday from 9 to 11, we'll have open lab. And it's not, it's for lab and lecture. So if you want to come in this Friday into the micro lab, 9 to 11, like I'll be there to answer lab and lecture, lecture exam, two questions, okay? Okay, you guys take good care.